All right. Um, okay, so my name is Maria Emerson. I'm one of the editors for the Journal of Library Outreach and Engagement. Um, I'm one of the new editors, so you probably haven't uh, heard of me yet. Um, but uh, we wanted to put a spotlight on some of the authors that were in our most recent issue that was released this summer. Um, so thank you for those who are able to join us. This is going to be pretty laid back. Um, I'm just going to give each author a chance to talk about their work and the process that went with it, um, anything that they want to highlight in particular. But then after that, we can just open it up for Q&A. Um, and authors are free to ask questions of each other as well. And we can go from there. Um, so I'll just call on authors if that's okay with you. Uh, we can start with um, Anna Morehouse. Anna wrote, uh, When the Doors Close, Promoting Academic Library Services in a Remote Environment Through Strategic Storytelling. So Anna, if you want to take us away. Uh, sure. I'll just introduce myself. Um, yeah, I'm Anna Morehouse. I work as a communications and marketing manager at the University of British Columbia Library. And that's on our Vancouver campus in British Columbia, Canada. And our campus is situated on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam. Um, a little bit about me, my pronouns are she, her. And to give you a brief visual description, I am a white woman with straight dark blonde hair tied back and glasses wearing a dark blue shirt. And behind me is a white bookshelf with a framed black and white print on the wall in my apartment living room. And if you look really closely, you can see my daughter's kitchen set. <laughs> Did you wanna talk about your article a little bit and then we can move on to the other authors? Sure thing. Um, so yeah, I, my article mainly dealt with um, the time when UBC Libraries physical branches closed in March 2020 due to the pandemic and as a result our library services uh, shifted significantly and were expanded. So the comms team that I'm part of we created a three part story series to promote these new and modified library services and my article. Um, explores why narrative communications is an effective marketing tool for our library. And I also take a detailed look at how we built this story series. So uh, kind of diving deep into the three act narrative framework and detailed story arcs, and also how I conducted my interviews to get quotes and why it's so important to package service stories with elements like high quality images. Um, I also talk about how we pitch these stories to the campus community and got them amplified on channels outside of the library. It's kind of the high level Coles notes. Thank you. Um, we can move on to uh, Chris Markham. Um, he wrote the characteristics of effective outreach as perceived by library student assistants. Um, do you wanna talk about your article a little bit? Yeah, sure. I'm the uh, just a little bit about me. I'm the head of access and outreach services at the Copley Library at the University of San Diego in uh, San Diego, California. Um, and my paper really was kind of um, inspired by <laughs> the fact that I was trying to figure out um, how could I actually reach students in particular, and what kinds of things might students be interested in in terms of outreach initiatives and programs that the library might create or I might create in my role uh, uh, at the library. And that was kind of what got me interested in the topic in the first place. Um, in terms of the methodology that I deployed for my paper, um, I did in-depth interviews um, and I did a census of student assistants who had worked at the library for at least two years. So I identified 13 student assistants who kind of met the criteria um, that I was looking for to make a census um, and was luckily able to interview all 13 of them. Um, in terms of doing in-depth interviews as a method, um, studies show that in-depth interviews are really the one of the better methodologies you can deploy when you're trying to understand what a particular group of people think about something. So that's one of the main reasons I chose um, in-depth interviews as my method. Um, having 13 students, studies show that you need at least six to eight interviews to make in-depth interviews you know, meaningful in terms of results. So felt comfortable with in that in that sense as well. Um, let's see. Um, I developed and piloted and revised like an interview guide for, for the process. Um, I used an audio recorder to create digital audio files that I then transcribed using like a transcription service. Um, and then um, 
that data that I gathered, you know, was um, stripped of personal identifiers and coded. And I had a colleague work with me um, who we we kind of separately uh, coded and then came together to see what we agreed on to ensure like the we had inner uh, inner reliability in terms of the coding. Um, and what else? Oh, and then I also used Microsoft Excel as a tool to um, analyze some of the data I got. So I got demographic data from the students, used Microsoft Office or Microsoft Excel to analyze that, and um, also got, um, um, oh, uh, I had each student participate. As part of the interview process, students also did listing exercises. Um, three different ones. So I also used Excel to analyze um, that data. And then I use a tool called Dale, uh, Delve, uh, which is like an online um, tool for analyzing um, um, qualitative data. And it's like subscription-based. That's the tool I used um, there. Um, in terms of my results, um, I think just the, the main thing as far as the results that came out, um, Student assistants are well informed <laughs> when it comes to library resources and services, so they do make good informants when you're asking questions about what's what your campus might think uh, about library resources and services, at least from the student perspective. My um, findings also showed that um, effective outreach according to students really should combine multiple modes of communication. Um, and they need to be uh, in order to be well promoted. So the top two characteristics that that showed up in my results in terms of what students think would make for effective outreach are well promoted um, and uh, incentivized that they have some kind of incentive, either material or non-material incentive for students to like participate in uh, whatever the outreach initiative is. Um, so like examples of like a non-material incentive would be, like extra credit was a really high one, um, or opportunities to network with other students, socialize with other students, or network with professionals in their chosen field was really high non-material. And material incentive was, incentives that came up over and over again, food was like top. I mean, food I think appeared in the transcripts 120 times over 11 of the 13 interviews, I think it was. So like that's as a non-material incentive to get students um, interested food was, you know, really high on the list. Um, and then some other um, res results in terms of my study were um, as far as characteristics that students identified, student involvement, in other words, having students involved in planning the outreach, executing the outreach, marketing it was really key. Um, um, timing, in other words, the most important thing about timing that was identified was, you know, that it doesn't conflict with classes or other things going on, on campus. But they also talked about duration. You know, they don't want to do things that take three hours, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, drop by, drop in, asynchronous, um, but also timing in terms of frequency. So students said that, you know, things, outreach initiatives that are consistently happening, they can attend monthly or weekly, or it's an annual thing that they know about and that they can get excited about every year. They know this is happening. Uh, and the final thing was just like intangible characteristics, things like fun, uh, it's fun or it's unique or it's modern. And some of those were more difficult to define and nail down, but some element of something intangible that was very consistent in the findings too. Um, so that's it about in terms of the method and the findings um, of my paper. Thank you so much. Um, and then we also are joined by Andrew and Dina, who co-authored um, with several other authors a uh, conversation with the organizers of Saving Ukrainian Cultural Heritage Online. So this is a special featured article that we had in the last issue. So Dina and Andrew, I'm not quite sure how you want to coordinate that since you both wrote it, um, but I'll let you introduce yourselves and then talk about your article. I don't know, maybe Dana, would you like to introduce Sutro and I can talk about the article itself? Sure. Um, uh, Sutro stands for Saving Ukrainian Cultural Heritage Online, and it was an all-volunteer effort that got launched uh, on Twitter, basically. Um, uh, Sebastian, uh, Quinn, and Anna, in the first few days, took it from 
hey, somebody needs to do this thing to, I guess we're doing this thing. And within four days, there were 800 people. And within two weeks, there was 1,200 people. I was there on approximately day four, and I sort of became the accidental community cat herder um, and uh, sort of process wrangler and uh, approximate stacker of things in order. I took two weeks off of my job to throw full time into this. Um, and unfortunately, I've not been able to be as connected once I've had to go back to my job with some family issues that have happened in the meantime. But uh, it was the, the fastest moving, most transformational experience that I've ever had in terms of getting people from literally 20 different time zones who whose native languages were not always English uh, doing the same thing in the same order without stepping on each other's toes and uh, keeping the, the information pipeline moving into a you know literally um, you know spit bailing wire and duct tape thing we were we were throwing together on the fly as it was being built and used. Yeah, so if you haven't come across Sutra before, it's an effort to archive uh, digital cultural heritage. So museums, libraries, uh, schools, uh, you know, cities that had material online. And uh, fortunately, it's hard. It, I mean, it's hard to remember the moment when it felt like it was very possible that Ukraine would just fall and that, you know, um, that fortunately didn't happen, um, but um, all of these materials have been saved. There's, uh, I think, 15 terabytes, mm -hmm. uh, 15 terabytes of data that was saved. So this was a community effort to save things that, you know, it's become very clear that uh, the intention of the Russian military is to, uh, uh, just, you know, remove traces of Ukrainian culture in the areas that they're that they're. Uh, occupying and soon uh, adding to Russia. So saving that history uh, has been really important. Uh, and, you know, regardless of whether or not it's recaptured. Um, but so this is a community uh, that got together and has saved this. Uh, it was really an important sort of coincidence that uh, Sebastian brought um, a new technology that, that hadn't been used in the past. So most often, a web archive is just like a static image of a website. Um, and what um, Browser Tricks brings, so this technology that this group has been using, uh, it basically sort of creates a virtual browser in which you can interact with the site as you would if it were on the internet. So it's and sort of- super helpful hmm? for like the video tours too. Like several of the places that we captured the video tours of no longer exist. They've been bombed since we captured their data. And I just wanted to put that into, you know, why, why this was so important to do. Yeah, so I mean, there's, I mean, just, it's one thing to have the files, but, you know, a website is, is a, it's a combination and a, it's an experience. So being able to archive the experience of interacting with those uh, exhibits and 3D uh, objects is really important and something that Sutra has been able to do, given this partnership. So, um, yeah, so the article was just, um, an effort to, you know, document the people behind this important project and understand how it came to be, and hopefully to foster these same kinds of efforts, uh, because it initially sort of followed the example of data rescue, which happened uh, in 2016, and there was concern that climate data would be removed from servers or simply neglected and and lost, and so that was a very uh, um, important. Uh, example. Uh, there's also the nimble tense um, kinds of projects. There's a, a project called Separados, which tries, which documents, you know, if someone had, if a family member had been taken by ICE to a facility, where are these facilities? So um, creating community resources and gathering information. So there were previous examples of this kind of effort, and we were interested in talking with the organizers to, to see what happened. And as Dana is saying, it was, it's, it's it's an interesting model to put forward, and it's difficult for librarians because it's it was completely chaotic and freeform, and it's it can be very difficult to go to a supervisor or to uh, you know um, people who allocate resources and say what we need really is 
you know, just this freedom to let the community emerge, let let us find the means to 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 do what we we feel is important to do. Uh, so I, hopefully, it's an it's a a provocation. It's it's sort of a, a placeholder for the kinds of conversations we can have. So this this kind of activity can happen uh, in our libraries. Uh, and it's certainly something that, you know, Quinn Dabrowski, the, uh, one of the leaders of this, I mean, she's been, on, Dana, you would know, she's been on uh, CBS, on NPR. Uh, I mean, I have never seen a library project get, uh, have this kind of visibility uh, and coverage in the media. So it's really been something that's, that's um, really been, you know, it, it's not Lizzo, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's very near that. So I'll, I'll put a link to the article if anyone would like to read it. Thank you so much. Um, the rest of the time is really just for Q&A. And again, this could be for the authors to ask questions of each other with your process and your article more. Um, you can use chat or raise your hand or just jump in. I have a couple of questions too, but I'll let other people ask first. I have a kind of a, I don't know if it's a silly question, but it's a simple one. Uh, I think you referred to the technology, um, Andrew, as a, I think you said browser tricks. Is that my, how do you, is that, is there like a, is it spelled just like it sounds or I'm just kind of. Not interested. exactly. Yeah. T-R-I-X, not T-R-I-C-K-S. T-R-I-X. I thought so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm interested in um, learning more about that tool. Uh, yeah, and that tool has also evolved over the course of the project, uh, because mm -hmm. initially it was something that you needed to have a program called Docker installed on your computer. So it was something that had a relatively high technical bar to it. And then over the course of the project, they in in implemented something called Browser Tricks Cloud, which basically like you could just point it at the URL and it will do all of the things that uh, that you want, but you don't have to be at concerned with the technical side of it in the same way. And Sebastian really hit the accelerator on the development of that because he hadn't been planning on releasing it for like four to six months later than when he actually got it out the door for us. And that took the number of people who could use it from maybe 10 or 15 out of a couple, you know, 1200 volunteers to literally everybody, all 1200 volunteers. We had a six year old who was so enthused about using Browser Tricks Cloud to capture Ukrainian cultural heritage sites. It was amazing. Well, I was wondering if any of you would be willing to go more into like some of the challenges that happened with your research, um, either within like the project itself or the research process when writing the article and some of the benefits that may have come from it as well. Uh, I have a couple of challenges I'd be glad to share. Um, COVID uh, <laughs> and COVID, um, obviously COVID, but Something that stuck out to me when I was thinking about some of the challenges of the project, there's two big things, there were two big things for me. Um, one of them is kind of, I don't know, mundane, but I think it speaks to something that's important when you're about the research process, and specifically piloting and the, the value of piloting um, um, whatever your method is and, and whatever you're doing to gather data, like how important it is. Um, when I I used a product called Transcribe Me to transcribe the audio files. And I thought I had done so great piloting, you know, my all my tools and, and everything like that. I did a couple of interviews, learned a lot about, you know, tweaked my interview guide a great deal based on the, the couple of pilots that I did. Um, figured out, oh, you know, the audio recorder needs to be kind of this distance and this and, uh, you know, little things like that all the little details that you that are that you discover when you pilot um and were so helpful and i was like yeah i did a great job piloting i'm ready to go um one thing i didn't do was actually go to the end to the pilot was the kind of analysis part right so when i got ready to analyze my data i i get these transcripts back from the audio files and they're like you can't tell who's speaking in any of the interviews. There's parts where the transcribe the the tool that transcribed them didn't hear what the student was saying or what I was saying as the interviewer. So there were holes. So I literally spent, I mean, I don't even know how many hours, like weeks going back, 
kind of cleaning up the transcripts, clarifying who's speaking throughout the transcripts, going back and listening to the audio to see what was that word, what did they say, um, and cleaning that up. So, you know, that was a huge time suck that probably um, maybe could have been avoided. Like maybe I would have chosen a different transcription service or something um, or found some solution there so that I wouldn't have to go back and do that. But yeah, when I realized, oh man, we can't even tell who's talking because it was just like text. It was like, uh oh, this is going to take a while. So, I mean, you know, I would just sort of say as a challenge, you know, understanding the value of piloting and really going all the way to the bitter end, like pilot everything. What tool are you going to use to analyze the data? What does it look like when you put in some pilot data? You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, if you're still working on this, do you know about otter.ai? I don't know. I don't know about that. No. Okay, auto.ai is some of the 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 systems that are partially behind uh, Zoom's automated transcripts, and it will identify the speaker along with the, the words being spoken. Yeah, I could have used that, <laughs> and and luckily it was me or one student. You know, each interview it was so so it was you know there was only two people to identify. That was luck lucky, I guess, um, for sure. Yeah, thanks for telling me about that, Dina. And then another challenge I had was um, just how much I had to learn about um, how to successfully conduct in-depth interviews. It's a method I had never used. So, and, and actually I'm new to publishing in totally, totally in general. So for me, the, the big challenge was just um, getting up to speed and learning everything that I want, that I needed to learn to be successful. And so I would just say, if you're new to a method Think about um, what is your timeline and how much time, build in plenty of time to learn what you need to learn um, to be successful deploying a new method. And for me, it was really important to have a lot of support from a lot of different people, you know, colleagues who knew a lot about, you know, um, in-depth interviews, for example, had good advice. Um, colleagues who knew a lot about um, analyzing qualitative data had good advice. So if you're doing something that's new to you, first of all, have confidence that you can do it, but you know that it's gonna, that you need a lot of time to, um, you're gonna need some time to, to learn the method and you're probably gonna need a network, at least I did, to sort of um, support you throughout. Um, so, I mean, those were my two biggest challenges besides COVID and, and being, um, being a head of a department in my library during COVID, particularly access services where we're the you know the public services of the library was just a major uh setback <laughs> um in terms of my research agenda you know during this time i would say that the uh the sucho time experience was like pretty much a 180 from that by definition we didn't have time things were being bombed as we speak sites were going offline as we speak i got there on day four and i was lost the minute i landed and so I'm like, I don't even speak Ukrainian. I uh, I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. So my first challenge to myself is a figure out what's going on. B figure out how to communicate to everybody else what's going on. C keep that information pipeline going so that all the new people who are pouring in over the next couple of weeks will have some clue and some pointers as to what was going on. I would be learning something on one day. I would be teaching it to people around the world the next day. Um, I had to develop the training that fast. And the only reason I, I, I would give it a 24 hour cycle is because we had people in 20 time zones. I had to give them a chance to see that the training was going to happen. When I landed, they weren't recording things. I'm like, okay, record all these trainings. I will make a, a list. We will have Google Docs. We will have pinned locations where you, where people who come in tomorrow and next week can see what these trainings were, so that you don't have to redo them every five hours. Um, I, my job is information design, um, which includes a slice of usability, a slice of workflow, a slice of accessibility, and so. You know, as a person who knew nothing about the Ukrainian language, nothing about the Ukrainian culture, I was sort of osmosing bits of Ukrainian as, as I went along. But uh, the place that I found in this all hands on deck thing was to figure out what I uniquely knew how well to do and where that could be useful for a super high, fast, you know, high speed, fast moving 
quick changing sort of environment try to put just enough bumper rails on how people were feeding information in and be ready to clean it up by hand because we didn't have the time to build more formal structures we didn't have the budget to go out and buy a database and develop it from scratch and create all the authentication systems like trust and free tools were what we had and we did the best we could as fast as we could because we didn't know how long anything was going to be there Uh, I can I can speak to the uh, challenges that we had. It, um, like Christopher said, COVID was <laughs> the major one, and actually the the whole point of uh, the story series that we built out um, when the branches closed in March 2020. Um, we we still had an entire campus of students that needed to access library services, um, so it was. For us, timing was an interesting factor because we both, for the first story that we put out, we had yeah very little time. We needed to just get it out and um, let students and faculty and staff at uh, UBC know what was available to them, what they could still access remotely, um, and and yeah, who who they could go to for help at the library to continue their work um, during a unprecedented time. Um, but for the second two stories, those were published several months later uh, in, I believe, April and May of 2021. So for those, we actually had an abundance of time to kind of craft what we were going to say. Um, and the landscape of the library system at that point had changed as well. Uh, we had a couple spaces that had, well, one space in particular that had opened up and a couple on-campus services that had opened up, including um, what we were calling materials pickup service so that um, a, a, a library users could basically order books online through our catalog and then go to a specific site on campus to pick them up. And it was, we'd never had anything like that before. So it was uh, kind of an educational piece um, to uh, let library users know how that worked, where to pick it up, what protections were in place to keep them safe while they while they did that. Um, and for those final two stories, uh, we also had one physical location, um, the Irving K. Barber Learning Center that was open, um, but there was quite a few, again, protections in place to, to keep people safe while using that space. So, um, for us, we wanted to make sure with those second two stories that it wasn't just about getting the information out there. It was also about letting people know who was who was behind all the services, who who were the librarians and library staff actually doing this work. And and we wanted to make sure that their their voices were heard and their work was recognized. So um, one of the one of the challenges for that was. Uh, well, actually, the photography. <laughs> so one of the big things that we do with our stories is we make sure that we have high quality images to go along with them. It's a lot easier to get them amplified on other channels. For the first story, we obviously couldn't do a photo shoot because no one was allowed on campus. So um, our design specialist at the time created some illustrations that looked fantastic. And then for the final two stories, because again, we had some access to campus space and we had more time, we were able to schedule some photo shoots. And um, it was it was important that we did that because not only were these stories about uh, telling people how to access library services, but it was also about documenting uh, something in our campus history and our library history. And a lot of these photos actually ended up being used in several other publications as well, including our annual report and our university's strategic plan web website. So it was well worth the effort going through all of the hoops that were set up to be able to schedule the photo shoots and get those done. Um, in terms of outcomes, um, Maria, you mentioned um, like some, um, I guess, positive out <laughs> outcomes or wins. Um, for me, um, in terms of doing the study, um, I did achieve what I set out to achieve, which was kind of understanding 
what might be engaging to students, at least as they perceive it, what they think. Um, but really my practice, I just think the whole experience had so many positive implications for my practice in librarianship and like my job, uh, not just like, uh, you know, publishing an article and learning all about that process, things I didn't know before, but really understanding that, or I guess what the conclusion I've come to now since doing this project is that good outreach is really about collaborating with the people that you're trying to reach. Like when I first started doing outreach and be, that became part of my job, I was thinking about, well, you know, what kinds of things would appeal to faculty or what kind of event could we do that students would be into? And, and you know, things like that kind of in a vacuum sitting around, you know, thinking about what can we do? And I realized from this project that really it's about identifying the group that you want to reach and engaging with them. Hey, what are, what are y'all, what would y'all be interested in doing? Oh, we could do that. How do we, you know, how do we work together? So having, having the group that you're trying to reach involved in actually planning things that they want to do or that they want to see or that they want the library to be involved in, to me, seems like maybe really where it's at and what it's about and kind of going to be testing that in the next like few semesters here um, in my institution and really not worrying so much about what I can think of, but more being focused on who am I trying to reach and what did they, what are they, and having a dialogue with them, you know, hey, you guys, y'all want to bring a speaker on this topic to the library? Y'all want to do this kind of thing, that kind of thing, and just kind of being there to um, support folks and create outreach initiatives and programs that are really driven by the people we're trying to reach as opposed to us driving the, the bus, so to speak, if that makes sense, which sounds kind of obvious now as I'm saying it, but honestly, a few years ago, it just wasn't, you know, I wasn't seeing it that way. And this project really got me, opened my eyes to, um, to the importance of that, you know, in terms of when you're trying to develop good outreach programs and initiatives, having everyone engaged in that, that you're trying to reach is like a first step. It's not just like, let's create something for this group. It's let's work with this group to create something, you know? If I, if I could follow on that, I mean, in software development, there are tools, uh, open source tools that are that everyone uses. It's sort of a common resource that we all need. And there are certain companies that will hire someone to work full time on that. And it's sort of a, a way to be a community partner and to, to uphold this infrastructure that everyone uses. And I think Stanford has done a good job or set a good example in this case with Quinn uh, in that she really had to work full time on this project uh, for Sucho because it, like you're saying, Christopher, it's not, it's not like there was a direct, you know, it's like this, these are Stanford collections or these are, are uh, Anna's at Tufts that like, these are Tufts collections and we're promoting things. It was just that, no, we're responding to uh, a moment where that, you know, where we need to act. And um, there was flexibility and support for people to, to, change their roles and to do something that they that wasn't in their formal job title but had clear importance and clear brought clear benefits to the library albeit in unusual unexpected ways yeah from from my side i could do so much more during the the time that i could afford to take as vacation and just sink everything into sucho but you know, I'm not part of a library system formally. My day job is technology services, central campus IT. So my upper management was like, okay, you take vacation time. And I was super grateful to my boss to be able to take that vacation time on like effectively zero notice. But when it was over, I had to do it outside of my day job again. And my ability to stay involved has, has dropped off significantly. And so that's one of the ongoing open source things is when it's no in no specific person's wheelhouse, how do you keep it going? Because somebody's got to take that, the, the role that Quinn has taken. Um, and very few people have the ability and the institutional support to, to keep doing that. Yeah, if I can, if I can add to that, it's, it's, it, you're right, there's, 
it's the people that make such a difference to everything like the the technology technology obviously is very very important and having access to the open tools but having someone to drive the work to to lead the work um i know with with um with our project one of the things that was very important to me to capture was making sure that uh it was the voices and the work of the librarians and library staff who were who were working on site during um, during COVID, it was important that that their work was highlighted. That was that was the important part. They were they were they were taking risks. They were um, they were doing doing critical work during a, a challenging time for well at, at our at our campus. And it was as a as a communications professional, the thing that I take probably the most the thing that I'm most proud of is being able to highlight work like that. Um, but yeah, it's having having the right people in the right place in the right in the right roles is extremely important. Another thing that I learned from Sucho is that everything that I thought I knew about what was necessary got thrown out the window and it was all hands on deck. So like part of my background is I was a double major in English and technical theater and the stuff that I have learned about improv, I used so much more of that than I did, you know, the like if you had asked me in the middle of January, what would be needed to archive the entirety of the public facing web content of an entire country? I would have said, okay, you're gonna need to give me um, at least $3 million and at least five years. And like we were in there, you know, with an all volunteer team with no formal command structure, no formal reporting lines, just everybody doing what they could but you know that it, it it had the capacity to turn into too many cooks really really fast so we were figuring out how to crowdsource the information in the workflow at the same time that we were figuring out what to do at the same time that we were changing the platforms uh, at the same time that we were changing the processes and um during that first two weeks me being in there 12 hours a day you know, taking communications from one channel to another channel to another channel was really important. And I, I feel badly that I can no longer do that. I hope somebody has been able to take on that role since I've had to go back to my day job. But um, A, you can do amazing stuff, but B, you really got to know how to improvise the faster that you got to move with the less structure that you have. Um, but on, on the flip side, like none of this was coming through formal, anybody's formal university approval process. Nobody was going out for CFOPs. Nobody was out go going out for requests for, you know, this or that or the other and bid processes and, and all, the, all the usual trappings of how to get something done. Um, and what we were able to, you know, sort of stone soup together was amazing. Can I, can I ask you a question about uh, how, how did what communication channels did you use during the project? I'm very curious about that. Like, how did you recruit volunteers and and coordinate? Volunteers came in largely from Twitter and social media. They went to the website where they applied to join our Slack channel. On day one, like there, like there was like 18 different Slack channels, and uh, everything was wide open. And then fairly shortly thereafter, we realized because we had no capacity to vet who's coming in, we needed to keep the sensitive data locked down to people whom we had vetted. So we started doing uh, channel-based lockdowns fairly early on in the process. Um, and then we, you know, we had people sort of heading up each team. There was, you know, I was communications and processes and then several other folks, like we had some people who folk, who specialized in the browser tricks doc, Docker version, some people who specialized in browser tricks cloud, some people who specialized in metadata management, some people who specialized in like security, information security, um, you know, some people specialized in where are the bombs falling right now? Let's prioritize those places. We had some people who specialized in, you know, data visualization, um, just 
whatever skills people were bringing in with them, we figured out where to put them and sort of, you know, you go here, you go here, uh, crisis management sort of thing. And then our primary communication tool with each other was this massive, massive Google spreadsheet that um, had a lot of automation built into it. But because there was, you know, at least 75 people in there at a time and sometimes three to 400 people and there was 18 or 20 tabs, uh, there are levels of automation that we wanted to be able to do that we could not do. We wanted to be able to look up and see, is this site even up? We wanted to look up and see, you know, is this uh, actively in a spam alert? You know, has somebody flagged this site as having been taken over being a problem? We couldn't put that level of automation in because um, the the spreadsheet just slowed down to the point where it was unusable by people. Uh, so we had sort of a pre-filtration spreadsheet uh, after a couple of days where you know, because, you know, people would just be adding lines straight into the spreadsheet and then, you know, five copies of the same thing. And, you know, you've got, a, you know, 5,000 line uh, list of sites to, to archive and it keeps growing. Uh, people were telling us they're spending more time trying to find a site that hasn't already been done than doing their actual work. So we had an intake team that where things would be added into the intake spreadsheet. And if they pass the check of they haven't been done already and they're not a spam problem, then they get passed up to the main spreadsheet in different tabs so that, you know, the browser tricks cloud people look here, the internet archive people look here, the uh, Wikidata people look here so that, you know, no one person had to deal with the entirety of the thing all at once. That is, that is fascinating. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, that summary. I yeah. So I'm trying to picture in my head what it would have looked like online, and yeah, that's <laughs> it's still hard to picture. Oh my goodness. Um, I, I had a I had a question for Christopher as well. Um, I you mentioned that uh, it's kind of doing this your research project has kind of changed your viewpoint on. Um, like planning services and how now now it's more like planning for the the library users rather than having a service and and uh, communicating it has there have there been any services that have arisen since or because of the research that you did well i wouldn't say in terms of services but in terms of how we're approaching planning for outreach it definitely has changed now, I only like this is the first semester since like it's been published and the results. So I, I feel like we have a couple of years now to sort of see how some of these things go. And, and again, we're talking about what students think, right? What they think. So maybe they're not right, <laughs> you know, or maybe some things they think are not necessarily like the best way to go. But I would say um, one of the major things in terms of uh, planning outreach and programming initiatives now is to have students actually helping us with that process in every phase of it. So from uh, when it's student oriented, from from what are what are some ideas that y'all think you know we want to do this semester? To um, how do we do it? How do we communicate it? Who do we communicate it to? What platforms do we use? To actually creating the marketing materials, students do that now. So implementing tools like Canva um changing how we analyze like social media and zeroing in on like the only platforms that students care about right now which by our assessment is like Instagram and um TikTok you know we're kind of the platforms that actually get significant engagement um so really just starting we're just in the very early stages of beginning to apply that concept of letting the users have a role in creating the outreach um so but for us right now the users are our student assistants in terms of helping us reach students and i'm just beginning and i've done a couple of things now with faculty too where getting faculty together like i'm the liaison to the history department so uh what kind of things do y'all want to do and actually we've done a couple of events with history faculty that were way successful su successful because the history faculty were involved in planning it more or less and they made their students come and they gave extra credit so some of these characteristics incentives things like that are starting to it's starting to look like yeah the students might be right about a lot of this in terms of basic characteristics that you can try to make sure are part of your your outreach 
you know, to be successful. So I, I mean, a little bit in that way, we're, we're sort of near, just underway, but, but definitely we've already made some changes in terms of how we go about planning outreach specifically. Um, we did, we created a lot. I haven't really thought about applying the same kind of thinking to services, honestly. Um, we did as many libraries, we had so many services that were suddenly like popped up, you know, during COVID, like now we're doing curbside, you know, now we're doing like seat reservations or, or think, you know, things that we just never did before. Some of those have gone away. Some of those have stayed. So I, it's a really interesting point that you bring up, Anna, to think about the same philosophy to creating new services is a good idea. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I the the research that that you did is very it's very interesting to me. I'm one of the things that I'm going to be working on. I am working on now is we have a, a library student advisory committee um, that I'm going to be heading up for the first time this year. So it sounds like I'm actually going to be doing a lot of the stuff that you did during um, your research, where I'll be. Uh, rather than one-on-one -on -one interviews, it'll be interviews, but like in a group setting, more like a focus group, but with students. And yeah, I've never done it before. So it'll be a big learning curve for me, but it, it sounds like it's uh, it's going to be very valuable from uh, from what the information that you gathered. And yeah, um, so thank you for, <laughs> for uh, the extra insight. Yeah, and focus groups are a good method for getting, um, uh, you know, what what do people think about things as well? That's another, it, be, besides in-depth interviews, definitely focus groups. And a lot of the some similar things that apply in terms of planning and, uh, and piloting and, and, and so forth. Um, and I will say, too, the realization that it's really about collaborating to create outreach with the groups you want to reach. I didn't articulate that in my paper. You know, that was something that kind of, I I sort of had recognized it afterwards. And actually in thinking about talking today and joining this group today, it's the first time I really sort of clearly formed a sentence <laughs> to uh to articulate it, you know, in that way. Um so that if I if I could go back and throw that into the paper, I would. <laughs> As somebody whose job is usability assessments. I'm going to raise the flag that I was trained to raise when someone says focus groups. And that is that the person, the people that you will end up hearing is as as an amalgamation of the, of the loudest voices in the room. Um, so it's important to make sure that you talk to the quiet people one on one as well. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah that just totally a really good that. point. And there's literature on that too, Deanna, that sort of fleshes that out and gives it guidance on how to deal with that exact issue. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually had a meeting with our assessment librarian um, who had previously co-chaired the group. And yeah, that was one of the main points that he had told me too, and how he gave me some techniques for how to kind of, yeah, draw out the quiet ones a little bit more and kind of, yeah, it's, it's a little bit about like managing the group as a whole and, and making sure that everybody's, everybody's voice is heard. So yeah, that, it's good to hear that reiterated as being a very key point. <laughs> we have time for one more question or we can wrap up. So I just wanna give anyone who does have a question a chance to ask it now. Um, and if not, we can start wrapping it up. I will stop recording.